I'm John Ellip, and with us today is Dave Lennox. Dave Lennox was in the World War II. That was a long time ago. Today is April the 4th, 2001, and we're going to hear Dave's story. He's going to tell us about his life in the Navy and uh, how he sailed around the South Pacific all during World War II in a very, very dangerous situation. But he survived it and uh, got a lot of things to tell us. Okay? Okay. So we'll get started here and uh, let's cut. Start off when I join? Yeah, what, what I'll do is uh, I'll just have you, I'll, I'll just ask you. Okay. And, and you just answer the questions and then, then you, you get to talk. Just tell your okay. story. That's, yeah. that's all. Yeah. You just tell me like we're having a beer and, yeah. and you know, we're just doing it. Okay? Okay. So uh, she's going to go and we're rolling now. So tell us your name. What's your real mm -hmm. name? David Baker Lennox. De and where were you born? Uh, Akron. Akron, Colorado. Yes. Yeah, and uh, when were you born? Uh, 4th of April, 1925. Today's your birthday? 9th. 9th. Oh, the 9th of Yeah. 9th of April. Okay. Pretty quick now. Yeah. Birthday. Okay, that's good. Okay, uh, and you were raised in Akron, were you? Yes. And... and uh, in world and how old were you when you joined the Navy? What's Seventeen. Seventeen years old. Yeah. And uh, did your parents have to uh, acknowledge you were seventeen and to yes. in? She, and they, she and they, signed. Uh, your mother did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you have any brothers or sisters? Yes, I had a brother and a sister. And were they in the service? Yeah, my brother was in the Navy before that. Is that right? War started. Before the war started. Yeah. So that was one of the reasons I joined. I knew this recruiter, and uh, and I tried to get in when I was 16, but they wouldn't take me. And then after I was 17, I was working on the railroad, and uh, and come in that Friday night, and the recruiter was standing there waiting on me. And he asked me if I wanted to join up, and I said, "Yep." Yeah. And he brought me to Sterling. And then they sent me on the train to Denver. And I got through all the, the rigmarole of signing up. And they got down to fingerprinting me. And they found that I didn't have two fingers. <laughs> so these two guys went back in the back office and, and talked it over. And they decided that it was all right that I could go because I still had my trigger finger. and. Uh, so that's what they told you yeah okay and uh, then they put it, me on a train for great lakes in chicago and we was in uh, i was in the navy one month in boot training and uh, i come home for 14 days leave and went back to chicago and i remember i got back to the uh, base and they put us all in this drill hall and they had bunks five stack five high and there must have been 5,000 guys in there and there was had to stay awake until your number was called and mine didn't get called until three o'clock in the morning and the next day they put us on a train and we went down through Kansas City, down through Texas, over to L.A., and up to San Francisco. And it took us five day, uh, four days and five nights to go to San Francisco. From Chicago. And the only time that we was off the train was 20 minutes in Kansas City. The rest of the time we was going. And there was, when they left Chicago, there was five train loads going to Frisco. Now I got in Frisco, and I was there a week on Treasure Island, and this guy come up that night, uh, that afternoon, and said my number was on the list that I had a ship. And I, this kid I was with, we decided we'd just go take this ship. We was going on Liberty Day that night, but we didn't have any money, so we decided to just go on the ship. And that's where we wound up on this ammunition ship. On, on board the ship. So, and so how, how long was it by the time that you 
enlisted to the time you were put on board that ship? Two, two months. Two months. Two months, yeah, okay, so it's pretty fast. Yeah. And, and were hostilities going on then? Was there a war going on then? Or this was <coughs> August, well, that had been uh, September of 42. So it was... So things were really popping. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Especially in Guadalcanal. Yeah, okay. And uh, so we got, I got on the ship and they was almost loaded. And we went to Pearl Harbor. It took us a month to go to Pearl and unload and come back. And, and I don't remember what, too what much. What were you hauling? I think we had everything. I, the first two trips that I made, kind of fuzzy, I don't right, remember that's, exactly. Sure. Okay, that's fine. And, but uh, we come back to the States, we'd back to the States just one month of the day we left. And we loaded up again, and I think we had a little bit of everything. As I remember we, we had some torpedoes and, and shells of all descriptions and small stores and a anything that was going Toward the war effort, we had it. You were hauling, yeah. And uh, uh, one month back to the States again, and as I remember, we made three trips to Pearl. And one trip, they had us loaded with almost all the small stores, anything that was laying around. And then they had, on the upper deck, we had about a five-foot walkway between the holes and the side of the ship, and they put potatoes, boxes of potatoes in there, filled it clear up to even, and then we pulled in over to Oakland Air Base, and they put a, two Piper Cubs and a Beechcraft on two. top of the hole, and we pulled into Pearl Harbor and they unloaded that, and then the, during, during that trip, we got a bunch of rats from the potatoes. And so this, we'd be up on watch, and the skipper wanted to get rid of the rats, so he was offering 25 cents a piece for, if we'd catch the rat. <laughs> and, and of course, we was up on watch, and we're, this is early in the water. If you've seen a rat, you went for the rat, and forgot to watch. Yeah. <laughs> and then that, if I remember that trip, we pulled into Pearl and we had to stand watch while we was in Pearl Harbor. Sure. And uh, this particular trip. And I remember this one night, there was 15 of us up on the bridge. That was our watch station. And we supposed to keep one guy up on watch. He went down to get coffee. Fourteen of us was laying across the bridge and uh, on life, uh, life jackets and had raincoats covering us up to keep the mosquitoes off of us. And we were sleeping and I looked up and I seen somebody stepping over me and come to find out it was the skipper. <laughs> <laughs> he and was, was checking just, on you guys a little, huh? just, just like a bunch of dominoes. After he stepped over and went by, everybody come up. Popped up, yeah. Where, how come you were up on deck? It was hot, was it? And yeah. More comfortable? Well, we, we were supposed to be on watch. Oh, you were, oh, you were actually on watch? Yeah. <laughs> oh, and you were laying there. <laughs> but the idea, we, we kept one guy on watch, but the rest of us did sleep. <laughs> and then... Uh, what did skipper say? Nothing. Huh? He, he was a good skipper. He never <laughs> said nothing. And uh, we went to um, come back, and we loaded up in Port Chicago, uh, which was a ammunition dump up the Sacramento River. Okay. And, uh, and then we finished loading at Mare Island, and we went to uh, Espirito Santos, which is in the New Hebrides. Okay. And... Uh, how long, pulled, that, how long did that trip take you to get to there? You got any idea? It a took us... Weeks? Maybe longer than that, huh? Uh, I think I, it was 15, 20 days or something mm. like that. Okay. Uh, um, 
I don't remember exactly, but it, it was quite a while. Yeah. And um, and it, this New Hebrides was just close to the Guadalcanal area, and um, but it was a nice harbor, and we pulled in there in November, and it was beautiful weather, and we had a full load of bombs on, and there wasn't an aircraft or carrier in the vicinity. So we sat there for two months, and you get up in the morning, and you play cards, or you go for a swim, or it, and it was really enjoyable. You, it, it didn't have anything to do and, and just played. And, and when you went into New Hebrides, did you, were you a single ship that made that trip or did you, was there a... Yeah, we run, a single, run single. Wow. Yeah. And, and, no, and no escort or anything. Huh? No. And we, we got almost to, uh, this was the second trip that we went down there. I'll go from, but I tried pearl diving while I was there. Yeah, did you? Yeah, but I couldn't go deep enough. Yeah. But, but it was one adventure. And then we got ready to come back, and we had 200 cases of beer. And the skipper said, well, we're going back to the States. We'll, we'll uh, give the Army 100 cases, and the other 100 cases we'll divide up and have a party. So every day for four days, one-fourth of the ship would take their share of the beer over to this little island and have a beer party. <laughs> well, they had figured out 13 bottles apiece, <laughs> 13. plus, yeah. and you had three hours to drink it in. Oh, God's sakes. So you can imagine what, the, what it looked like. And uh, <laughs> then we brought 50 guys, Army guys, back, and we really wasn't equipped to haul troops. And we got two days from the States and run out of food. And all we had was bread and rotten hamburger. Oh my gosh. And how many how many men on your ship? Three hundred and fifty. That was your crew. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then uh, we pulled in started to pull into Frisco and uh, Port Authority called out and said uh, your uh, Orders are turn around and go to San Pedro, California. <laughs> and the skipper said, no, we can't do that. We got 50 extra guys. We, and besides that, his wife and kids was in Frisco. <laughs> and he says, we're not going to San Pedro. So we turned around and headed out to sea, and all of a sudden, one of the engines quit. Wow. And the skipper called back to Port Authority, and we lost an engine. We've got to come into the harbor. So we pulled into the harbor that, that night, anchored out in the bay, and they finally found us a berth the next morning. And, and uh, I remember going on Liberty. I was the first Liberty party to go the next day. And three of us guys hit the first restaurant we come to and had them order up three orders of ham and eggs and milk. Because <laughs> you hadn't eaten for three days or four days. So. <laughs> and then we went, to, went to, made two or three more trips to Pearl again. And uh, I went down to one of the deals uh, I was in Honolulu. I went down to Waikiki Hotel and went out on the beach. And of course, the Navy had taken it over, and, and the beach wasn't very good because it had. Uh, tank barriers all over the beach yeah. and, and big concrete things. Yeah, so. and uh, and I never did. I just hung around in Honolulu. What time off we got? We couldn't. We could get off in the afternoon, but we couldn't stay overnight in Honolulu at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we'd never seen too much of Honolulu as itself. Um, and, and where were you anchored then? In Pearl? You yeah, were we, Pearl then. We tied up what we called the potato dock, but it was next to the sub pins. Okay, I know. They're in Pearl. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One trip that we was pulling in there, the the there's a couple aircraft carriers and a bunch of destroyers out sitting outside waiting to get into Pearl. 
And we pulled up there, and and in the Navy, the Admiral goes first, and then, and then the next one. Of course, we was the low man on the totem pole. But here, the Skipper was getting a little antsy, and he wanted to get in and get tied up and get ready to unload. What, and what rank did he have? Captain. He was a he four, was a four, four striper. Four striper. Yeah. Okay. So he he had quite a bit of. Uh, well, that's a pretty high rank yeah. in the Navy. Yeah. In fact, we didn't rate him, but we had him. Anyway, uh, he decided it's time to go in, so he pulled in front of this carrier and pulled right into the. <coughs> oops. Pulled into the. That's okay. Into Don't worry the about um, um, front of the aircraft carrier and pulled up and. And we was for the dock, and we was going a little too fast, so they, uh, they decided somebody decided to drop the anchor and, and slow us down a little. Drag the anchor. And uh, when they pulled the anchor up, it had half the cables in Pearl Harbor <laughs> hanging <laughs> on. It. <laughs> <laughs> so kind of made a misjudge of the and bumped the dock and just about tore the dock down. And, the next day, he gets a phone call from the admiral of the base and tell him to come over and see him. A bet. <laughs> and uh, so then, then we left and went to back down to to uh, New Hebrides. And if I remember right, that, that Christmas day of '43, we was tied up in the Havana Harbor in the New Hebrides. And one of the guys had went up and talked to the skipper about using the, one of the whale boats. And 10 of us got in the whale boat and went over to the, they had a freshwater stream run up there. And, and their army base was there and they had guards and whatnot and nobody said anything. We went up, up the stream and we went probably three miles up there. We went far as we could go. Went through a couple of native villages and Never thought too much and just played around, swam and had a good old time. But I remember it was a Christmas day. And this got back to the, uh, the bay there and this guard stopped us and wanted to know where we'd been. And we said, went far as we went. He said, uh, did you see any natives up there? And he said, yeah. He said, don't you know them are headhunters? <laughs> 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 and later on, I looked it up, and, the, and there is headhunters in the New Hebrides. New Hebrides, yeah, right. <laughs> and in those days, they were still hunting heads. Yeah, and uh, so we left New, Mia, uh, New Hebrides, and then we went to Trawa. And I remember that Trawa because it was just a mound of sand, and they had blowed almost every palm tree off of it. And, and uh, we didn't stay there for too long, but they'd already taken it over. And, uh, but I d remember one of the visions I had when I first looked out there, you seen these 55 gallon drums and it had a, a wooden propeller on the front of it. And it had a kind of a crankshaft deal on the back and you couldn't figure out what it was. You would see the, wind turning this thing and this this thing plunging up and finally I asked one of the guys what it was and he says that's their wash machine. They take and put their clothes in there and they <laughs> let the wind the do the job yeah. instead of having to do it by hand. Well, that's a clever idea, yeah. And then we went to Kwajalein on up to Majuro and that's where the fleet was supposed to be the last time the fleet was supposed to be all together. And uh, when we pulled in there, we pulled in there one day, and we was the only one there. And they were supposed to take over the island of Majuro the next day. And here we were sitting in the yeah, harbor. Ahead of time, But, huh? but uh, I think the Japanese had already moved out. But anyway, the Indiana and the Washington run into each other. And it damaged the bow of one and the fantail of the other, and we pulled along, alongside the Washington. And they had a repair ship on one side, and we was on the other side. And when we pull alongside a ship like that, you pull alongside, 
tied up, you swing your booms out, you open a hole, and it takes quite a while to do all this, get the, all this out. And we just got about ready to start taking the ammunition on. And here comes a high flying plane, just just barely buzzing. And this uh, admiral on the Washington said, "You got to get away from us. We got to have our guns so we can shoot." So we had to close the hole, swing our booms in untie our lines and pull out and went around and that plane flew on across and and uh, so then we pulled back up alongside and was that a <laughs> jap plane uh, it was japanese nobody shot at him or nothing and finally after three times he finally left and didn't come back he was just looking around wasn't he? and uh, then we come back as I remember, to come back, and that's when I got leave. We come back, and they put us in dry dock, and I had a 14-day leave. And you hadn't had any leave up to that time? No. And how long had you been on duty? What, two years? Yeah, Pretty two close. years. And where was dry dock? In, in Pearl or in, in No, in Mare Island. Oh, Mare Island. And, and Frisco. Okay. And... Uh, so I rode the train home and, uh, and spent 14 days, but it took, what, two, two and a half days to get home oh, on the sure. train. Yeah. And then when I got ready to leave, I knew the train master, my mom knew the train master, and he, so he said, I'll fix you up. He says, I'll get you on the Zephyr uh, <laughs> um, on, on our uh, leave papers, you wasn't supposed to ride the Zephyr, you were supposed to ride the milk trains. So I went down to the, uh, Fort Morgan and, and picked up the Zephyr, and I got on the train, and it was there three minutes, and it pulled out, and the conductor come along, and he looked at my pass, and he says, you can't ride this train, and I said, well, I had reservations to ride it. Showed him my reservation. He says, you still can't ride it. So he finally put me in a corner there, and I rode sitting on my suitcase for about 100 miles before I got a seat. <laughs> and uh, then I got back, and we pulled out, and I think we went to back to Majuro, and then we went on up to Ulithi, which was, was uh, no, we went to Saipan. Saipan. All in the South Pacific. Yeah. Okay. And, and uh, we was, they had taken Saipan over, and, uh, and um, they was working on the island of Tinian next to it. And we are sitting, so we could watch all this. And, and for three days and three nights, the fleet just circled the island of Tinian, lobbing shells in it. And then the army guys from Saipan was lobbing them over into it. And the second afternoon, we, radio man, he hooked up the intercom and then to these spotter planes that was running for these battle wagons. And we were sitting on a fantail, and he had the speaker up there, and you could hear this guy from the airplane. He says, hold your fire a minute. He says, I'll go down and take a look. And you could see him dive down in there, and he'd come flying out there. He said, lob a couple more in there. They're still shooting at me. <laughs> and, and we were sitting there listening to all of this and watching it, just like being in a movie. And uh, that afternoon, the uh, Japs pulled a, seven inch gun out of the hills and hit the Colorado. And next morning they pulled alongside of us and they had 40 dead and 200 wounded. Wow. And we loaded them full of ammunition and they took all their dead and wounded off and they pulled out for Guam the next day. And the, in the meantime, the fleet was there and this aircraft girl called. Who was one, the admiral of the fleet? Who was, do you know who was commanding that fleet? No. What was the fleet number? 
I don't remember. Yeah, okay, that's right. Uh, uh, this aircraft car pulled up. Everybody was coming in. Uh, destroy yard call and say, I want so many shells. And we, a boat would pull alongside and we'd load them up. And, and so this aircraft carrier pulled up and said, take anything you got. And <laughs> in the meantime, we had accumulated three 2,000 pound bombs. I don't know where we got them, but we we had them. So we knew that they was no good because an aircraft carrier can't handle a 2,000 pound bottle. So we put it down a number five hole, clear back in the far corner, and we figured we'll, they'll be there forever. So they said they'd take anything, so we was going to give it to them. And we, I mean, we worked like dogs, getting them out of there, oh, rolled man. them out, loaded them onto this boat, got it all ready to go, and he took off from the ship, and about that time we seen smoke come out of that cure, and they took off. Oh, 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 that afternoon, that boat come back around, we loaded them shells back, back aboard. 2,000-pound bombs, huh? But that, those are those would only go on something like a B-29 or something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. And then then we pulled on up to Ulithi, the, uh, what we called, it was a bunch of islands. And the biggest island was about four blocks square. It only had one or two trees on it, and it was just a sandbar. And they called it Mog Mog, and it was Liberty Island. You got to go over there every fourth day and have two can uh, cans of beer. That was Liberty. <laughs> that was Liberty, God. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we pulled in there, and, um, and we'd been there quite a while, and one morning I got up and was up on the top side watching ships come in, and this one oil tanker was coming in, and uh, a Japanese two-man sub sunk it right as she was coming in. Wow. And I seen this happen, yeah. sitting there watching. Anyway, that for two days they run around that harbor with patrol craft trying to find that sub. Right. And they finally found it laying under a aircraft carrier. And, and, but the thing of it was, they dropped them depth charges, and every time one of them depth charges goes off, you, th you thought sure that they'd got you, uh, that they'd hit our ship. Yeah. Because sure. that noise, it just, it kept you on. And uh, then we was loading one night. Uh, they had aircraft carrier pulled in there, and um, we was working night. We hadn't lit up like New York City. And about that time, we heard a airplane come flying, come across this aircraft carrier and drop the bomb on it. Right. And the second one come up flying across it and drop the bomb on it. Wow. And as the second one pulled off in front of that carrier, a uh, cruiser sitting there picked the second one off. And how they done it, I don't know. But that kind of caused things to shut down for a little while. I'll bet. I know we shut our lights off real quick, like. Because you guys are sitting there on, with all that ammo. If they hit you with a bomb, <laughs> that'd be the end of the show, wouldn't it? Oh, uh, I forgot. We did. I think it was bef the time before that. We had loaded that Port Chicago, what we call Port Chicago, which was uh, up the Sacramento River about 10 miles. They had an ammo dump up there. And, uh, and uh, we had started loading there, and they had these Negro work crews working it. And the boatswain hollered at one of them guys. He was dragging a hook across the deck. And about that time, the whole bunch of them come out of the hole, and and they was ready to have a fight. So we broke out the rifles, and and they called the Marines up then, and they come down, and took them back down to the base. <laughs> and uh, now were they were those guys in the service, or were they? Uh, yes, they were yes. in the service. Uh, the just black a minute, and I'll let you know the, the rest okay. of the story. Okay. But the, the got in a fight with the Marines then. 
So anyway, we left there just one month to the day. And there's two ships blew up. In that, in that, that these guys was loading. Wow, is that right? But but we had just left there one month to the day, and them two ships blew up. But that was, if you remember, the, they had a picture show of the mutiny in Port Chicago. No, I don't know about that. But go ahead. Yeah, but they had, anyway, a they had a movie about it, huh? Yeah, and some of these guys mutinied because they, and they did have a raw deal, really. Because they went into the Navy and they promised them everything and they had them working just like slaves out there. Yeah, and and basically, they didn't teach them anything either. Uh, they didn't just labor. teach them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but we had moved up to Mare Island after we left Port Chicago at, to finish loading. And I remember one, I come back off of Liberty one day and uh, it was a drunken party, and most of the guys was drunk coming back. Anyway, there was a hundred of us walking down this dock, and there was two hundred of them Negro workers coming back. And somebody said something, and we had a battle royal right there. <laughs> Is so that the, right? Next morning, the admiral called us up and said, if you... You are restricted from Mare Island. You can't set foot on Mare Island. If you want to get off the ship, you go over to the side, crawl in a boat, and take it over to Vallejo. That's the only way you can. You can't set foot on Mare Island. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, also at that, about that same time, we had changed skippers, and the old skipper that we had became exec on Treasure Island, and they decided to have a ship's party at the hotel in Oakland. So that night we got to the hotel, and almost all the guys was there, and this old skipper of ours sent 50 waves over for the guys that didn't have girlfriends. <laughs> he did. <laughs> so you can imagine that. I don't know what I was thinking, but I was about half drunk through the, uh, the whole deal. And I remember walking out of the hotel. Three of the guys were standing there. They had a fifth, and they took a couple of swigs. And the next thing I know, I'm back at Mare Island. The SPs have had me. I don't have no billfold. I must have been in a brig. I had a cut over one eye with three stitches taken in it. <laughs> and I don't remember anything. Any of that, huh? What happened that night? That was the <laughs> night of the ship party. <laughs> anyway, we go on to Ulysses. We sat in Ulysses for eight months. And uh, the, I know the battleship Missouri, I think the battleship Missouri or New Jersey. Anyway, one of the old battleships pulled up and they was, we was kind of on the outside ring, and uh, they pulled out over there and they was gonna have target practice, so they sent up this drone, and, uh, and I think it was New Jersey that, that was up there first because she had firepower that wouldn't quit. And they sent this drone up and they sent it across, and I mean the whole side of the ship opened up on it, and, and it flew off, and, and made another pass, and, and they made about six or seven passes, and I mean, when they opened up a whole thing. So we didn't think too much about it. So the next day, this old battle wagon pulled up alongside over there. They sent up this drone, and they started to make a pass, and, and they heard a <laughs> and down it went. <laughs> so they sent up another, only they put it out a little further. And they started making a pass, and they down she went. So they sent out the third one, and I mean, you could not even see it. And they started making a pass, and you know, down she went. They figured that was good enough. <laughs> Quit on them, huh? And you talk about gunnery practice. So we was going to Pearl one time. We we uh, uh, seen what we thought was a mine. So. 
skipper figured, well, it'd be good gunnery practice. So we called the gun crews up and we opened up on it and then blasting away and water spraying and everything. So they let the gun crew from the other side try it for a while. We must have been firing for 20 or 30 minutes and nothing happened. So that we wasted enough, so we we went on. He says, that must not be a mine. We couldn't have missed that. <laughs> anyway, coming back, I come back on a converted carrier, and they seen this mine, so they hollered at this sergeant to uh, lay up the flight deck with a rifle. And he laid up there, and he took two shots, and boom! Blew her up, huh? <laughs> With a rifle. With a rifle, <laughs> yeah, wow. <laughs> Weren't too accurate there. <laughs> and. Uh, so in the Ulithi, we sat there eight months, unloaded three times and loaded twice. Now when you say you unloaded and loaded? Well, the fleet had come in and we'd issue all these ammunition. Yeah. A merchant ship would pull alongside and we'd load oh, back they, up. They would, the merchant ship would reload yeah. you guys yeah. as an yeah. ammo ship, I see. Well, it was kind of a base. Yeah, I see. And, and, uh, and uh, so we sat there for eight months in this one spot, uh, and it got kind of hectic. We was, we was working uh, six on, six on. Only a six on, you're on six hours, but when you're off six hours, you're on off six hours. You, you have to sweep down, you have to eat chow, and you have to take a shower, and, sure. and write a couple letters, and, and then you get about an hour's sleep, and, then you're back on for another six hours. But we done that for well, a couple months, as long as the fleet would sit in there. Yeah, and uh, load them up with stuff, huh? So then they got the call. They was getting ready to invade Okinawa. So okay. they wanted us to go with the fleet and service them at sea. And this old boy that was in charge of the cargo in the harbor, he said, no, he says, yeah, one of these other ships can do that. He, we'd kind of give him a nice cabin to live in, and where them other guys that put him down the hole with the crew, <laughs> he had it pretty nice on our <laughs> ship. So he, he didn't want to get a, a, want us to get out of there. Yeah, right. <laughs> in fact, it was probably fortunate that we didn't go because we might have not come back. Anyway, the uh, we stayed there for eight months, and then we moved up to Lady Gulf. And they had taken Lady uh, yeah. in the Philippines, yeah. and uh, so then we moved up to Lady Gulf. How far and, how far south of Leyte were you? Which, which it's you about a three a three day run for three. us, uh, which was uh, probably five hundred miles. Okay. Or, yeah. Okay. Uh, Ulithi was there was an island of Yap or something like that in that string there yeah. that was only about a half days. They were a little worried about it because the Japs was on it and they had, hadn't taken it, but they were skipping and going up to. Uh, up to um, Lady. Well, a lady, and also up to to um, uh, Sarabachi, the island of um, I can't okay. remember now. The anyway, they. That's okay. Go ahead. Uh, in uh, when we pulled into uh, Lady Gulf. It was close to the end of the war then, because uh, we was getting a little worried because we had more ammunition on the ship then than we ever had, and they had these LSTs and whatnot coming across. And of course, when they send them across, they'd load them down with anything that was going that way, and of course, add quite a bit of ammunition. So they pull alongside of us, and we'd load it on, and we had ammunition stacked all over the place. And uh, I caught the working party. They had a bunch of garbage and whatnot. 
they wanted to unload. So we had the LCM come alongside, and a whole, I mean, it was just like a semi truckload. So there's about 10 of us in the working party. We pull over to the island, and the garbage dump was just down from the native village. And we pull up there, and boy, we just hit the beach, and and the natives was all over that. That load. And they started unloading it, so we figured, well, they're going to do the work. We'll, we'll just take off. So we went up to the village and chased around for two or three hours and come back, and shoot, they'd only taken what they wanted and left the <laughs> <laughs> So we had to finish unloading it. And by that time, the the tide had went out and we was just sitting high and dry. Couldn't get the boat off the beach. <laughs> so I and another kid scoundered a native canoe and rode out to this nearest ship out there and sent a message to the ship that we was high and dry and we couldn't get off. <laughs> Till and, the next tide. Uh, and then one of the guys was regular and at that time, the the war would be uh, ended, and uh, the whole harbor lit up when the war ended. And uh, and uh, the next day, there was a couple. Of, there was an aircraft carrier sitting over there, and a couple of them pilots was playing around, and they was doing loop to loops, and this. One made a loop and come out, and the second one made a loop, and, but he, he was too close to the carrier and hit the end of the carrier. Oh, dude. And yeah. he was due to go home and killed him. Too bad. And, uh, Were you guys, did you, did you ever undergo, like, uh, attack by, uh, did they ever attack your, your ship? Was it under fire or anything like that? N not, not really. No, I, but you were close. Si si Saipan was as close as we ever got. They yeah. could have hit us. Yeah. But uh, and we were sitting in plain view of it. We were just sitting right off, uh, just about two, three miles from from uh, from that. But that was the closest we ever come. And of course that that sub got in the harbor in New Lethe. That was yeah. close. And oh, that yeah. airplane laid a couple bombs on it. There, that was close. But then we went on, after the war was over, we went on up to uh, Okinawa. Okay. And, and we was in Okinawa, and uh, a typhoon come through. And, and you talk about one big storm. That was one big storm. I forget, the, I think they said it was 145 mile an hour wind. Wow. And there was five big ships was high and dry up on the island. And I think they lost 2,000 guys, something like that. Anyway, we was, we was uh, anchored in the port there. And there was about, I don't know how many ships was in a port. But was, anyway, we was running about half speed to keep us from dragging the anchor. Only you couldn't tell where you was at because water is just a wall of water. And I was back on the fantail and and uh, and we swung around, and, and somebody looked up, and there was another ship swinging around. We went down, they went up, and when they come down, and the, the guys had hollered at the skipper to tell him to kick it in the uh, gear, and we pulled out just enough, and we had what we called a convoy light, which took two foot off off the fantail. That other ship come down and cut that light off. That was how close it would come. Oh, wow, is that right? And uh, in the meantime, we seen these guys floating by, and, and uh, we was always trying to catch them, throw them lines and whatnot. And this one kid come by, and, and they seen him coming pretty well up by the ship, and he was pretty close to the ship. So, boy, they started throwing lines throughout him. I mean, everybody on the ship had a line. And the last guy, he had uh, what we called a cane fender. It was a, a 
bunch of cane that that, that you put between the ship to keep right. it from bumper, yeah. And they'd had a line on it, and this last kid he just throwed the line over the side. He didn't know whether he was going to catch. Anyway, that kid caught it, and we drugged him aboard, and they finally had to cut the line in two to take him down to the because he wasn't going to let go of the line. Oh, really? He was going to hang on to that line forever. And, and so <laughs> all through the service, we never lost a guy. Is that right? And we come up one to the good. So so I would say we was about the luckiest ship in the, that, in the Navy. That's unique, yeah. And, and also, you talk about storms. We did hit a, in a, I think it was the second or third trip to Pearl, we run into some ground swells, and they was 60 and 70 feet high, and it was just like going up on a roller coaster. And for a whole day, we just went up and down. We didn't go any place. We just went up and down. And they, some way or another, they got me to steer in a ship. And I was only 17 years old, and I didn't know the front of, from the back of the ship, really. Anyway, that morning I was up there and there's 14 of us in the wheelhouse. And I, when you hit them waves, you didn't hit them head on because you, if you hit them out head on, you'd have a tendency to uh, sink, yeah, really. Down, so down, so you'd down. hit them at a little angle and kind of ride over them. So when you hit, hit, hit this wave, it had the tendency to pull you. Well, that, that was all right as, as long as the back was in the water. But when you come up over the top, no power. Well, no power and no uh, no steering, because right. they, <coughs> uh, so it was uh, kind of tricky. So I'm up there this morning, and, and I didn't know the first thing. You had a uh, a degree that you were steering to, but with that all that water, you, you, it just take you every time, it took you everything you could do to keep it in line. Anyway, the skipper had his boy bring up the breakfast, and he was sitting over there next to the wall on a table there with, on a stool, and there's 14 guys in the wheelhouse, and something happened. Either a freak wave hit or something. Anyway, we rolled 35, 40 degrees. 14 guys is on the deck with the Skipper's breakfast. I'm the only one standing, <laughs> hanging on the wheel. <laughs> and so then they went down and inspected number two hole, which was, and they had fifty thousand five inch shells stacked in the center of it. Fifty thousand. And they broke loose, and it was just like he poured a can of beans in a room. It was all over. So in order to get to the number two hole, you had to go through number three, up through the resistor house, and back down into number two. Well, then going up and down like this, you get down in that hole, and then sensation of going up and down, about three humps, and you were sick. And then you had one guy sit on the shell while you picked up another and put it back in place. And we finally got most of them back into order and we, down in the next deck in number two hole, we had 16 inch shells. 16 inch shell armor piercing shells weighed 2,000 pounds apiece. Wow. And we had one standing at the end of this walkway that we didn't have room enough to get it fit in, and they had it tied against the wall. It fell over, and every time we'd roll, this shell would go down that passageway and hit the bulkhead. <laughs> and they thought it was going to go out through the side. Yeah, right. 2,000 pounds. Well, my God. Not, not only that, how do you stop a 2,000-pound shell? You don't get down there and wrestle it. So finally we got a bunch of manila nets down in there and finally got it cornered and tied down enough to... Wow. And I remember one time we dropped a net of 16-inch powder in number three hole, and when it dropped, it busted a couple cans open. And, and that 16-inch powder is about like your little finger, only it was just like a, if you'd have a full can of ether and just 
dumped it. I mean, there's a lot of ether in it. So just a minute that broke open, boy, they shut everything down. I mean, every light bulb, yeah, anything. Right. And we got it cleaned up. One other little deal that I forgot to tell you about, we pulled in to Pier 53, and this ship is only, it was built in 41, so it was a new ship. It had only been out a year and a half. Pulled into Pier 53, and they decided it was a fire hazard to have linoleum all over the compartments. And it was what they called battleship linoleum. It was quarter inch thick, and you'd take a mop, and you could just, it was beautiful. Decided it was fire hazard. So in the meantime, we'd slept on our blankets for a year and a half, and they was all cruddy, and so they took them down to the commercial laundry and had them all done, and I mean, they look beautiful. White blankets. And they saw and they tore all this linoleum out, and they decided that what it amounted to, they'd put sand, glue, and paint mixture is what it amounted to. The sand was to keep you from slipping, yeah. and the paint was to color it, and the glue to keep it. They just got the mess hall done, and I slept right off the mess hall. In our compartment, this is all done. Somebody dropped a match in it. <laughs> and it just went <laughs> and, and it did burn a little here and there, but it, it mostly had vapors. Yeah, just to pop. And our white blankets look, <laughs> I'm telling you, it just made you sick. Anyway, so the skipper said, well, you got to clean it up. So. We, we started in cleaning it up. And the fire trucks hadn't hardly even got there, and the phone rang. And it was one of the guys on Liberty calling from this Red Hat saloon where all the guys used to, practically the whole crew went down there every time they went on Liberty. They was calling back wanting to know what happened and how they found out. <laughs> anyway, the, any guy that come back off Liberty that night just turned around and went back ashore because they didn't want to have to help clean up. Clean up the mess. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you uh, you ended up the war in Leyte. Leyte. Okay. I mean that's when the war was yeah, over. But you right. Know. And then what happened to you at the end of the war? Did did you come back on the ship? Or no, the we went to we went to uh, Okinawa. Okay. And we went through the typhoon. Yeah. Then I had enough points, okay. So I got off the ship. And the first group had enough points. He, the skipper, talked him into signing over for thirty days to to ride the ship back. Well, they back were still the on the ship, and we was ready to go. And he come by and wanted to know us if we'd sign over for thirty days. <laughs> Said, "No way, we're going we're out of here." <laughs> so we went ashore. And the first morning, I, we was living in tents over there. And this is November, and it was getting pretty cold. And we wasn't used to that because we had nice warm compartments. Got up the first morning, went down the chow line. Got her chow. When we come out of the mess hall, his master sergeant grabbed us. Got a working party for you. So. Went down to the working party. So the next morning, no breakfast. Didn't eat breakfast. Didn't have no working party either. <laughs> next morning, we caught the mailman. Sent a note to him, tell the skipper to send us some food over here. They're starving us to death. <laughs> and so the next morning, the mailman come over and he had this bunch of loaves of bread and coffee and <laughs> <laughs> and the first night we slept in tents, we got us a bucket and made a fire in the tent, went over to the next tent and tore the floor out of the next tent and to put in, the, the, to burn fuel for our for your fire, uh, keep and it then warm. <laughs> the next day, in fact, I hadn't been on there two days, and I caught my name up on the list to leave. 
I went down, crawled in a longboat, and we took off looking for this ship. And three o'clock in the afternoon, we see it. It's heading out the harbor. And we can't catch it. But, oh, 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 oh. but it was an oil, oil tanker, nine notches, top speed. Oh, God. So we went back to shore, and I was there a week and caught a converted aircraft carrier. And they had five bunks high, 5,000 guys on it. Wow. And it took us 15 days to come from Okinawa to Seattle. And uh, when we pulled into Seattle, everybody was on top side. And a tugboat pulled along with a band with a bunch of gals on it. And boy, somebody said, women. And the <laughs> whole bunch went to one side, and that carrier went like that. <laughs> And I thought I thought was we was going to turn right? her over right there because because they blowed all the ballast out and we set and clear up and high and dry Real tough. and it was converted to boot which it meant that it was top heavy and I thought so they set it another tug and tug boats on the other side so half you guys get on the other side <laughs> I stayed in Seattle three days caught a troop ship to Frisco we left. Seattle and pulled into Portland, Oregon, Christmas Eve of 45. They said, Transies had to stay aboard ship. This ship's crew could have liberty. And it was the only time in my Navy career where the ship and the dock was even. Usually the ship, yeah. 20 feet in the air. This, it was just even. And I looked around and everybody was getting dressed and I said, I'm not going to be the only one to stay aboard. And I went up topside and there was 50 of us standing on a gunnel. And the officer deck turned his head and we jumped from the ship to the dock and took off and went to town. Jump ship, 5,000 guys jump ship that <laughs> night. <laughs> Pull, I pulled the next day, I went down to get Christmas dinner, and I was too too far down the line, and I didn't get no dinner. They oh, ran really? out of food. Ran out of food, is that right? And so then we got to to uh, San Francisco, and went through Treasure Island, uh, see Christmas, and, and I got out the January, uh, December the thirty first. I, I and two other guys was going to the train, and we we had our sea bags and whatnot. Oh, no, they shipped our sea bags home, but we had our suitcase, and we started for the train station, and we'd come to the first bar, we'd go in and get us a drink. And then we went down, the next bar we got another drink. <laughs> and then somebody stopped at the liquor store and got a couple bottles. By the time we got to the train station, we was pretty well lit. And that train was five cars of servicemen and three cars of civilians. And you couldn't get, servicemen couldn't get up to the civilian cars. Pulled into Ogden, Utah, New Year's Day. And they said 20 minute layover and that the train just unloaded. Went to the first bar. <laughs> Pulled in there and had them set a drink up and there was a couple of army guys sitting over there at this table and laughing and hollering and having a good time. And this one army guy decided he was going to leave. And he stood up and started to walk and fell flat on his face. He didn't have no leg. And he said, I forgot. No. <laughs> And then I pulled into Cheyenne. I got off the train in Cheyenne. I was supposed to catch another train to Denver. But I got out on the highway and hitchhiked. An old couple had a car and they took me to Denver. And then I hitchhiked to, to Akron. Back home. Yeah. Wow. That's a story. So what was the, so what was the total time you were in the service? Oh. Three years and four months. Three years and four months. Wow. And I was on this ship three years and two months. 
Yeah, so you well, basically did that. What was the highest rank you had? Then what happened to you then? So well, then m my folks had moved to Indiana okay. in the meantime. He had a, my dad had a brother in Indiana, and they moved, went back to see him. So they had moved, but I hadn't seen him for two years. So I hung around Akron for a couple months, and I could tell you a little story there, but I don't know whether it'd be appropriate. Anyway, <laughs> there was a few of us guys that just got out, and we partying every night. And this one night we was we was. Uh, I'd went down and got a fifth, and we'd gotten this one kid's dad's car, and was out and sitting in the edge of town, having a few drinks, and about that time the fire whistle went. Just what we want, some excitement. So we rushed back to town, and uh, pool hall to call our fire. So we was in there helping the firemen, and they was having a problem, and and the bowling alley next door started burning, and and anyway the next door was a beer joint and he got a little excited and so he decided he'd bail out so we helped him haul the booze out in the middle of the street and this is 10 o'clock at night booze out in the middle of the street and somebody went and got the keg off the tap and got a bunch of glasses so we sit down in the middle of main street and started drinking <laughs> beer <laughs> That the town was burning and you guys were drinking beer, is that it? <laughs> and the sheriff, the sheriff come over and he said, what you guys doing? Well, the guy said, he, we could have the beer. He said, he, he can't put it back on tap. He said, go ahead and drink it. Now, I remember going, I was staying with my aunts, and I remember going home that night. Anyway, the moral of the story, though, is a couple of days later, on this kid was walking down the street, and this couple of ten-year-old kids walking down the street, and pointing and laughing, and snickering, and knew something was coming. Just after this one got guy back, guy by uh, guy got by us, he turned around and said, "Hey, there goes the town drunks." <laughs> <laughs> Next Monday morning, I left town. <laughs> I left town. <laughs> so afterwards, uh, did you have a family, children, anything like that? I mean, no. Uh, how old were you when you got out of the service? What you were about 20, 20, 20 years old. So yeah, I, I got out in January forty-five. Yeah, now would have been twenty-one in, in April. April. Yeah, uh, my wife's brother got killed on Okinawa. He, he would have been the same age as I am. So but what did you do then after you got out of the service? Did you? I went back east to see the folks. And got back there and spent all my money. So then I went to work in the Ford garage. Okay. And then I got to know this kid and his dad owned a body shop. And so I went, I started working in a body shop and I worked that four years. And uh, and see, you were a pretty young guy when you got out. Then, so what's been your profession since? I mean, well, I worked uh, body work for ten years, and then I finally uh, we got married and and uh, had a few kids, and, and I couldn't make enough doing body work. So then I went to work for Willard Reed Lumber in Fort Morgan. Okay, and. Uh, and I worked there for four years, and then I got a job with uh, Sterling Lumber, okay. uh, working for Wayne Curley. Wayne, yeah, okay. And uh, it just so happens that Wayne's wife was a neighbor. They just lived about five doors from us, and I'd played with her all my life. Oh, is her. that right? Yeah. So, in fact, I worked. When I went in the service, I was working on a section gang in the railroad, and I was working for her dad then, uh, Kinslow. And, uh, but I worked for Wayne Curley for 13 years. And then I went to McCook and managed the yard for a couple of years down there. And, and then I went back to Morgan and worked at a yard there for a couple of years. And finally worked to work for 
Glenn Smickley in construction. Okay. And I finished up. That's what you've been doing. I see you got a Smickley yeah. jacket. Yeah. I worked for the old man 10 years, and then I worked for the kid six years. Okay. What about, uh, how many children you got? Seven girls and a boy. Have you really? Wow. One of them's a millionaire. Really? One of the girls or one of the boys? Well, one of the girls. Is that right? How'd she get to be a millionaire? She got out of high school and she went to business school in Parks Business School in Denver, and and they gave her a lead on go to work for First Bank in Denver, mm -hmm. and she's worked for them for thirty two years. And uh, the other day, I got a slip out of the paper and showed that her their uh, profit sharing shares earned. Five hundred dollars a share last year. Wow! And, and she's got three hundred and thirty shares of it. <laughs> so does I figured I, I was. Does she ever send you any money home? No, no. you don't have this kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but well, but all, all her kids. It, you, you probably know Judy. Judy's a, a dean out at the college. Yes. Judy Jackie Mayne. Oh yes, I know her really well. And David. Well, she's one of your girls. Yeah. Okay. David is a maintained supervisor at uh, Debeshire's. Dave, oh, I know him really well. Huh? You know, uh, that's, I built Debeshire. Uh, you know. You've, uh, you've, uh, he had trouble with one of his eyes, and I think you've looked at it. Yeah, probably. Um, Betty, the oldest one, she works for the Colorado State University in the office. Rosie. She's uh, acquired a furniture store, and she had it paid off last year. And plus, where is she at? In Fort Collins. Fort Collins. Okay. She has uh, acquired uh, about five warehouses. Plus, <laughs> she's going to be a millionaire too. If she keeps up. And Darlene, she's uh, in Colorado Springs. She married to a. a, a He's not a teacher. He takes care of all the uh, um, computers for the school district in Colorado Springs. Okay. And uh, she does a graphic arts design business. Patricia, she lives in Denver. Her husband has a um, maintenance service maintenance. deal, and she works in the eye doctor in Denver. She does for an eye doctor. Yeah, okay. she Who's does it? pretty good. Is she? Yeah. I can't. I can't tell you who it is, but That's um, Wanda. She works for the army, uh, civil service. She had spent six years in the army, and then she had a baby and got out, and got divorced and lost her girl. Oh. And then uh, she went to work for the army. Last year, the Army spent $28,000, sent her to Syracuse University, paid her rent, paid her wages, and then she, she got out of, uh, uh, with a master's degree in business, and she's in Fort Moreau, uh, um, Virginia, working for the Army. She has a pretty good job. You got some good kids. They're all doing pretty good. An American campaign, I, I, I don't know really what that was. It was just a campaign of, of all of it. Okay. Uh, and, um, and this in, included Guadalcanal and Kwajalein and Trawa and all of that group in there and it's got three battle stars in it. Okay. This is a Philippine Liberation okay. with one star and that's the I don't know what that really is. I think it was just a medal for the one was good conduct and the other one was the just being in the service I think. Okay. And then the button 
I don't, that's just the added. Okay, but your bars? And that's the USS Rainier? Yeah. Okay. And that's the ship you hauled ammunition around the South yeah. Pacific in? Yeah. 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 Oh. Okay. And, and the fleet, the whole fleet was in there at one time. And it was supposed to be the last time the fleet was together. What date was that? You got any idea? Huh? What date? I, I, I don't remember sure that I had taken on the ship. And that was when we crossed the equator. <laughs> when you were a polywog. And and I was in the crow's nest on watch that day. Oh, were you? <laughs> January 46. Photo. And what year was that? What year is that? Mm -hmm. That was probably uh, five years ago. So it's been. Where are you in that photo? Uh, 